There we go. All right, so we are recording. And just so you know, I, I do believe we're going to try and publish this recording somewhere. So keep that in mind. And then I guess, Eric, you can go next. Sure, um, Eric Modio. Uh, I'm now on the VS Code team, created GitLens and a few other uh, extensions. Um, so yeah, and just, you know, since I've been, since I've joined uh, VS Code team, trying to, you know, bring co closer partnership with extension authors and sort of, you know, amp up our game with, um, you know, the community around that and, you know, the APIs that we're providing and all of that sort of thing to community reach out. So uh, this is, I mean, we had a initial call, but this is sort of like the first official uh, one that was publicized. And so this is great to get going. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna pick someone off the top. Tyler, you wanna go ahead next? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Hey everyone, my <laughs> name is Tyler. I'm a software engineer on the PowerShell team at Microsoft. Uh, and I, along with one other guy on our team, are the core maintainers for the PowerShell extension for, for VS Code. So is there anything yep. else I need to add to that? <laughs> no, you can, you can pick the next person. We'll just keep going around. <laughs> OK, sure. Uh, David, do you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm David. Um, I'm actually not a software developer as a full-time job. I'm a, a faculty at UC Berkeley um, and in economics, uh, but I have a hobby. Um, and uh, so I maintain the Julia uh, extension um, with uh, a good friend, Zach. Uh, so we're two, two people doing that. Um, and Julia is a, a relative, well, it's a decade old now, but a, a relatively new uh, programming language for scientific computing. And, and so we're maintaining that extension. That's amazing. I should pick the next person, right? Um, so uh, Alessandro. Hi. Uh, I'm the developer of the bookmarks and project manager extensions and a few Delphi Pascal extensions as well. Uh, I'm, I have a background in Delphi, so that's why you see a lot of Delphi extensions from me. I'm moving from Delphi to C Sharp and JavaScript, TypeScript, React, and things like that. And I participate in OS community for a long time. I think before VS Code started at private. And that's it. I'm from Brazil. And we are working from home as well. So I think uh, Yuki Weda. Hello, uh, I'm Yuki Weda. So I'm a doctor course student about uh, software engineering. So I am an author of the R language support for VS Code and uh, other readers support for the VS Code. So yes, I expect about the good discussion. Thank you. So who is remained? Say, Caleb. Mr. Caleb? Do you mean Taras? Hi. Uh, I'm uh, Caleb, and I go by uh, Almanon on, like, that's my open source handle. And I created the uh, A-Rebel. It's a real-time Python scratch pad. And that's pretty much I the only extension I maintain for VS Code. Well, sometimes I, like, contribute to some other random ones. And I'll pass it to, let's see here, uh, Connor. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Connor. I'm on the VS Code team. And for the past few months, I've been working on the JST bug extension, which is our new debugger. Um, so, uh, Pung? Um, my name is Pan. I'm on VS Code team um, for the last four years. Um, and working on editor, commenting, GitHub, and um, recently, Notebook. Um, that's me. Um, Peter, did you go? Uh, not yet. Thanks. So my name is Peter Pizarus. I am the CEO of CodeStream. We're a, a business that uh, produces the, the extension called CodeStream. 
and uh, it is a, a plugin that allows developers to easily discuss code from within their IDE. So we've got 12 employees, all of whom are working on this extension. And as I look through the list, I think we may have gotten to the little end of the list. I'm, if anybody else hasn't gone yet, please go ahead now. Yeah, I think, I think we Hi guys. Um, this is Taras. Uh, sorry, I'm dialing in. My Comcast is down today. Um, my name is Taras Novak. Um, so I'm a creator of Data Preview, Vega Viewer, and uh, GeoData Viewer extensions. Um, I've been working on them for the past year just to provide alternative views for data in VS Code, um, pretty much mostly in my downtime. Um, and uh, I created them out kind of like out of the need of, uh, you know, based on some data visualization and da dashboard projects I've been working on for the past few years. Cool. Um, all right. So we can, uh, so we can just jump into the, uh, the two questions. Although before we do that, I wanted to, I wanted to ask something since we, we still have like 10 minutes of the first 20 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I would like to start doing is um, some sort of, you know, we have like featured extensions on the marketplace and uh, I would like to do something a little bit more personal with some of the extension authors. So we, we had this thing uh, a while back uh, where we do an extension roundup where uh, I think it was Wade used to do this where he would just talk about um, maybe three or four extensions that did something interesting. And I, uh, I like the idea of a more like personal approach to that. And one thing that I would really like to do is just to sit down with somebody, an extension author who's building something and um, maybe just do like an interview style type thing and just talk about like how you're building extensions, uh, like what your setup looks like, something something a lot more personal than just like some extensions that do stuff in VS Code. Uh, so if any of you have any ideas or recommendations for, um, any extensions you'd like to see, or if you'd like to do that yourselves, definitely reach out to me. You, you have my email address. Uh, just send me an email, let me know. And then, um, yeah, so let's get into, let's get into the question of if you have two wishes to change your fix or improve VS Code or the marketplace, what would they be and why? This is very similar to the, um, if you had a magic wand and you could do anything, what would you do? What would what would help make your lives better? Just two, right? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, as much as you, you can want. start there. <laughs> <laughs> Give everyone a chance to get there too. <laughs> Feel free to jump in, anyone. Uh, I can go first. Uh, this is Peter Codestream. Um, so we have two it's like super critical. This is like the lifeblood, the oxygen for our extension is um, to what both of these are really important to us. Um, code and I'll just set set up the problem for a second. Codestream has a very, very rich UI. Um, it's all built in React. And so it has uh, its own um, sort of panels and uh, there, there's a, a lot to it. It's, a, it's an entire application built as an extension. And so the tree view of the activity bar was uh, insufficient for us to be able to render all the dynamicism that we provide. So we, we're doing this in a preview panel uh, web view. And the problem is that those tabs are disposable. So they come and go and they get buried. And it, it's not easy for us to put them in the right location. So we're sort of at the whims of the editor for where it ends up placing them. I mean, we can kind of guide it a little bit, but not much. And they get, uh, you know, quickly, it, it, they, they disappear and they get over, or, uh, you know, new tabs open in front of them, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, our number one ask is to be able to put that web view in the activity bar. Um, so we can also get an icon in the activity bar. Um, and a secondary solution, which is not as uh, helpful, but could be possible, would be a pinnable tab. So if it needs to be in an editor tab, give us the ability to pin it and make that the only tab that would open in that group uh, and, and allow us to put it in the right 
the uh, position that we choose or that the user chooses. Um, so that's number one. Um, so web view and activity bar and or pinnable tabs. And number two is uh, clickable gutters. Um, we also provide sort of rich interaction with the actual code that's in the editor. And right now we have to either, um, you know, we, we can expose something on hover or within the editor, uh, but what, what ideally we would have a clickable gutter similar to the way that commenting works when you have that sort of comment stripes with the plus button, uh, but we want to control what happens when you click. All right, the, that's a really good one. The, I know the gutter one is something that we've run into ourselves, and I'm pretty sure that I think that we can do um, panel contributions in the upcoming release. And I wonder if that will help with being able to put a web view in there. I don't know if you'll be able to put a web view in there, but all right, that's that's really good. Thank you. Yeah, not not yet. Um, it is it is on the short list. It's unfortunately get got pushed along because uh, we haven't gotten enough time, but it is on the list to to get done for web views in the sidebar or panel. Anyone else? All right, I, I'll go. Um, so uh, let me actually, so, so this does not count as one of mine, but one of mine, but I, I want to second the web view, uh, web panel thing that in, in the activity bar that, that would help us uh, as well. Um, um, so I think the number one for, for, for me, although we kind of worked around it now, would be the ability to um, publish insider or pre-release versions on the marketplace. Um, so we've actually now created a second of, uh, of extension in the marketplace where we can publish pre-release versions. Um, and that works pretty well, but it has sort of some corner cases that are, that are not uh, great. And it would just be awesome if, if this was sort of a built-in feature that I can uh, push a version out into as an insight to an insider channel of, of the extension, uh, and we have a group. We actually have a group of people that beta test our extension, uh, and for years it was incredibly painful because I had to uh, send out a message, say please install this new VSIX, uh, and then some did, some didn't, uh, and I think that would sort of, in terms of increasing the quality of the extension, uh, if that was all smooth and and with auto update and so on, would really help most. Um, the the way we've we've actually worked around this and have a working solution now with the second extension and and it's all integrated with Azure uh, uh, pipelines so that we can that I can when I tag a new version then it goes Azure pipelines there there are these environment things and I can approve whether it should be deployed to the insider or to the uh, market release uh, a version of the extension so it's pretty smooth and keeping some of that. Uh, would be nice so that it is sort of tightly integrated with something like Azure pipe, pipelines. But that would be my number one. Um, and then, and that's my clear number one. And then on my number two, I'm 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 wobbly. Um, so I'm I'm not going to uh, name a narrow feature. Um, I'm going to name a theme, which is of course a trick to uh, get in more things. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, but I kind of uh, so so we're really I, I feel there is a uh, an eco there are other extensions that are in the same space like we are so so we're essentially trying to build something like R Studio or you know a typical or you know an IDE for data scientists that that work with code and, and work with data uh, and I think there are other extensions that are in the same space uh, so I'm sure the R um, extensions you know try to do exactly the same feature set that we're trying to do except for a different language. I'm sure Python is is in a similar boat, uh, and 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 I'm 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 certain there are others uh, as well. And it seems to me that there are probably common UI elements for all of these, um, where it would make sense if if I don't know maybe we could have someone at Microsoft who is sort of in charge of the data science extensions and is interacting with us, and we could sort of try to figure out are there common UI elements that make sense for all of these that that could be in in the base product or something like that. So that's sort of my theme. And I should say that the, I'm incredibly excited about the current work on notebooks that, that's going into the, into the base uh, product. Essentially what I have in mind is exactly that for more things. <laughs> so, um, so I think that would be my number two. Awesome. And just, yeah, Peng is on the call and he's the lead on, he's built the notebook stuff, so. I love it. 
So let me let me repeat let me repeat that back to you just to make sure I understand. So you're, what you're essentially looking for is a, a partner internally on the VS Code team or, or somewhere in Microsoft that you can reach out to for like data science sort of experiences, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, right? You know, so so realistically, I'm. You know, we're working in isolation, uh, our team, the, the two of two. We're very well plugged into the Julia community. We're not in touch with any other extension author in the VS Code world. Um, and then, uh, and I think, you know, there are many extensions that are not relevant for us. I think there, there are a few uh, extensions that probably try to do the same thing. And I, I think it would be great if there was a bit more coordination between that group. And I think it would be great if that was actually the home for that would be at Microsoft so that it could also be linked up with what the, the core VS Code team is doing. OK, great. And then I have another question about the uh, pre-release extensions. <clears throat> this is something that I've been talking with the um, with the Marketplace team on. And the current working strategy is to um, allow authors. So if you publish just a Simver standard release, then it's just a release. So like we'll say 1.0.0. But if you publish a 1.0.1 beta, then that would be tagged as a, as a beta release. And then those, like if you were opting into like a beta channel, you would start to get those releases. If not, you would just skip those. Is that about what you had, had envisioned? So that so it's actually interesting. That's how I had originally envisioned uh, how this would work, and I think that would be a fantastic uh, solution. Um, the the way I've set it up now with this with these two extensions is different, and I, it's also interesting. And I'm not sure which one is better. Um, so right now, what I have is I tag a version with a version number, and then in Azure um, pipelines, I can sort of decide where each version gets published. So if whenever it builds a tagged version. I can uh, click on review deployment to an environment in, in the Azure Pipelines UI, and then I can decide whether I want to have this version go into the insider uh, version or deployed as the release version. And it's quite neat because what I now do, so A, we went to a much more frequent deployment strategy. So essentially, we, whenever we add something to the, to the extension now, we publish it into the insider channel. We wait 24 hours. If nothing on our telemetry and crash reporting comes in that reports that something is wrong, I just press another button and exactly that those binaries get pushed out into the release channel. So that's also convenient because I, I don't have, it takes a, it's sort of, I don't have to manage different versions manually. Real, I, I, you know, I ship one binary, I say, this is the snapshot, snapshot. And then as a secondary decision, I decide to which customer groups it goes. But quite frankly, I think either you know anything that would be more official would be would be awesome. So so so, um, you know, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for that. If I could just like piggyback off of that, um, I think like Visual Studio proper has had like kind of a beta channel thing uh, in the product for quite some time, um, and I'm not sure what the marketplace looks like in terms of. Uh, V6 is a VS Code versus V6 is a, a Visual Studio proper, but um, I imagine at least like taking a look at that experience and what Visual Studio has learned is probably worthwhile in some regard. Yeah, I think the, the marketplace also serves VS, so that's a really good point as well. All right, who else? Well, I guess I just spoke, so I, I can <laughs> go ahead and go then. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, naturally, just I'm just going to plus one on the, the beta releases. Um, that was uh, number one on my, on my list, um, for sure. Um, and it, and there's been uh, another thing that I had here was just like Semver 2 support in the marketplace altogether, because I had noticed that uh, you couldn't uh, publish uh, extensions with a uh, pre-release um, like in the version name at all, uh, which was kind of an odd experience. Um, I don't know if that's changed since I last tried, but um, but just, yeah, the feature request of, of beta channels kind of uh, fills that 
uh, void for me. But uh, my first one, uh, aside from the beta channels thing, is um, the ability to do syntax highlighting uh, from a language server. Um, so that's like semantic highlighting uh, versus uh, just regular syntax highlighting. Um, I'm, I understand that like some languages already have this. I think like TypeScript already has this and I, I'm guessing that's like just built into the product itself. So I'm, I'm hoping that one day in the future that will make its way to language servers so that uh, you know, we could provide a much richer uh, syntax, uh, syntactic highlighting experience um, than just a bunch of text mate grammars. Um, I'm because, pretty sure yeah. that I'm pretty sure that now in LSP, I don't know if it's been completely finalized yet, but as far as I know, you know, it, it is in the, the protocol. Um, yeah. So that the languages can provide. And so I'm pretty sure TypeScript is using, you know, the, the LSP uh, semantic okay. tokens. Um, and I'll providing. have to check that out. Because um, I know that like the latest thing was just like general progress support. So maybe it's in like a like a preview stage kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think when this iteration ships, then it's enabled by default um, for, okay. for TypeScript. Because TypeScript, I think, is right now the only language server that actually implements the, the things. But I think that it allows all the other languages to be able to implement it as well. Gotcha. OK. Yeah, it wasn't in the, uh, like, it wasn't available in the spec online. So I just figured I would throw that out there uh, in this call, uh, just because I want that feature as well. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other thing was uh, there is some funny behavior between auto closing pairs and snippets. Um, and I feel like it's probably best to just, if you don't mind, just let me like show you what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, go. It'll only take a second. Okay, let me share my screen here. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, I can increase the font here. Oh my gosh. Move this. Teams. My goodness. All right. Um, so this. Uh, so the scenario is I, I've got this snippet. Um, it's called. Here's the snippet you can see here, and. Uh, don't worry about the PowerShell specific syntax here, but uh, the snippet I'm expecting is this. However, um, once I've typed that left bracket here, it obviously uh, did an auto closing pair uh, as it should uh, for the bracket. But once I hit enter on the snippet, I actually get this dangling uh, auto closing pair down here. Um, and this snippet is actually used just a ton. People uh, end up right using this a lot. And so this extra bracket is something that like, it's just not a, a very good experience. Um, and I know that there's been like certain iterations to kind of fix this. Um, God, I think I had the issue open somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, and I could paste this one in the chat. But uh, this might not actually be it. This might be a different thing. Um, but there are, there are a couple things along, uh, around auto closing pairs uh, and snippets. This example is I can't have uh, an auto closing pair of, of just a single quote and then this uh, strange auto closing pair for a, a hear string. Um, but I'll, I'll just link this issue. But um, there is some funny business with auto-closing pairs uh, and auto-closing pairs and snippets that I'd like to be uh, addressed. And I will put this in the chat. Yeah, please do. It'll, it'll be helpful for especially languages that use a lot of 
um, you know, more more symbols than than just plain words. I think um, that uh, I think will be very helpful. So I think those were those were my two. All right, so that one you already have an issue for, so I can follow up on that one pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I find the other one regarding the the snippet, I will I'll throw it in the mix. But I think it might have gotten closed already, uh, as issues tend to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was definitely not fixed. So I'll look for that while someone else talks. So. Thank you. Yeah, when we're done at the end, I do want to circle back to your comment there on closed issues and just get feedback and thoughts on, you know, how that could be improved. I mean, you know, there's multiple sides to it, um, you know, totally get tons of issues. But there's, in my opinion, differences between things that come in from extension authors between compared to average users. And, you know, maybe they should be handled differently. Um, totally. But I'd love to get thoughts on that after this. Sure. <clears throat> hey guys, can I go next? Yep. So, uh, by the way, David, Tyler, nice to meet you. Um, I wanted to continue the theme that they brought up, um, building extensions and tools for data or data scientists, right? I certainly see, I just want to add to his comments, I certainly see some patterns where most of those extensions are built as custom web views. And um, I know there has been some work done on custom web UIs or some things like that. I think what's missing there is maybe ability to create custom toolbar toolbars because um, you know I've used a lot of different viewers, you know SVG viewers, you name it, and there's certainly a design pattern that's recurring across all of them. They, they you know typically have a top toolbar that allows you to do things for the particular web view you know zoom in zoom out toggle things um i think if that was standardized more through vs code api rather than letting developers kind of create their own custom toolbars that all will different um and you know uh, have ability to apply kind of uh the same styling and theming and other things it would probably simplify just creating the different viewers in general. Um, so that's one big ask that I have. Um, I haven't checked on the latest uh, custom web UI editor API, but uh, based on the threads I've seen, it looks like it progressed well and it's available now. So I'm definitely planning to switch to that. Um, plus one on beta releases, so like, my day preview extension has over 50,000 installs now, and I'm planning to do a major release, but it's kind of like, well, I don't know if I'm going to push another major update to all the 50,000 de 50, devs using it, right? Uh, lots of things can get uh, broken there. Uh, the other big ask I have for Marketplace team actually is, and I've mentioned this a lot of times, like sort of cooled off on those comments in Slack, um, provide simple dashboard uh, for extension developers to just see the stats for installs and updates. Uh, most app stores have it. It's not, it shouldn't be a, a huge effort, literally one line chart. And uh, because you, you guys are cracking it already, you're showing the install and download uh, accounts you know, updates some data store with the information. And when I look at my extension, I can see that over the past months, I got this many installs. I just pushed a new release. I got this many updates. So that it's much easier to track it. I knew, you know, a lot of extension developers have uh, sort of resorted to using uh, Google Analytics uh, for tracking all, all, all the information more. But I think it would be uh, much easier for developers to, you know, have proper app store dashboard to look at that stuff. And also, um, this is a side note, I've seen it with a lot of even good extensions. Developers sometimes do anonymous starring for extensions, do one star and there's no record of it whatsoever. You just see the star count go up, right? 
it's immediately greater than two or three stars it degrades to you but like not even a name of a person who did it most app stores actually just show oh you know joe smith gave you two stars that you know that's uh we could start there probably that's 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 all i have okay i, I like that so essentially what you're saying about the anonymous ratings is that the, the ratings are meant to be like a way to provide feedback to the extension author and you should be able to react to that, right? That's that's something. Yeah. Into. Yeah, there is there is like no no link to uh, the user uh, on like GitHub or Microsoft account or whatever. So it's and but like, you know, to start with, we don't even see who, who gave you one star, right? I would say if somebody gives you one star, I suggested that in Slack, uh, you know, prompt them for feedback. Why Why is it one star or two and not three or four, right? So yeah, that we can react down. to that and improve. Yeah, because it's, it's quite hidden, right? If someone doesn't leave a comment to go with their rating, you don't ever even see that. It's just a new count on your stars, which you don't really even know. Yeah. And it's cool, like for four and five stars, it's cool. I'm like, all right, somebody liked it, you know, buzzer, you know, click the star, you know, buzzer to add any comments. That's 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 great, right? Um, but yeah. Okay. I actually have another observation on the, if if that's okay, uh, just one other thing on the on the stars. Uh, it, um, so our extension has about 100,000 installs, and we have 16 people that gave feedback on the stars. We have about 500, what is it, likes or stars or whatever on on the GitHub repository. So for whatever reason, people don't seem to give feedback on the marketplace because it's probably too hidden. And then what you get is a very noisy, non-representative uh, 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 picture there. So I think I, I would actually say either make it such that you would encourage people to give more feedback on the marketplace by prompting people in the in the editor to give feedback or something like that, or use some other metric because what we have right now is is really I don't think is very useful data for people to make any decisions. If you you know if you have 16 people that gave you, that that's that's not a very you know useful it, metric. It's definitely so I you know I check daily and weekly extensions trending. It's definitely skewed more towards you know devs just trashing extensions, even good extensions. I'm not talking about mine, right? Uh, so I observed that a lot, and, and the low count is there's definitely a big, huge discrepancy and difference between those and what you see on the GitHub. Yeah, we we've seen that as well, especially when like um, an API changed in VS Code, and so there's like a little bit of an overlap where something in the extension is broken for a couple of days while we ship the release, and we start getting one star reviews with no comment because something is broken and so we, we're in the process of fixing it. And then once it's fixed, we can't even follow up with them and say like, please try it again. Anyway, uh, I, I had a question. I mean, it's been done. <laughs> yeah, I had a question for you on the dashboard. So the uh, I was really hoping that we would have this ship by now, but we are going to turn on a, a fairly simple dashboard in the, in the marketplace for publishers uh, that does have installations. Now I'm curious what other kind of data would be useful because right now in VS, so if you have a VS extension you're publishing, you get like an acquisition funnel, which is like you can see installs from the IDE versus the marketplace. Uh, you can see the um, like where the downloads are coming from, how many per day, like that kind of daily trend or thing. What else would be helpful? Like what kind of information are you looking for? So, um... I mean, that's great to hear. Uh, I look forward to checking it out. The big part, I think, would be the geo data seed, is it right? I mean, we can do it with GA, but uh, and the reason behind that is, uh, like, I've noticed, like, I know what regions uh, around the world uh, use my extension most, right? Um, so you know that, oh, you have a user base in China or Russia or Brazil, right? Uh, do you want to consider, well, if your user base, uh, you know, 30% in Russia, do you want to consider translating your UI to Russian? Things like that. So I would definitely want to get rid of uh, geometrics 
uh, in addition to just the you know the basic counts. Okay, that, the that's other a really, thing, really good point. The other thing I'll add is a a business who relies on extensions, and you know we we spend money to promote CodeStream, and so in order to be able to track which campaigns are most effective, if we had some way, um, you know, even to just put maybe Google Analytics on our on our marketplace page, that would be helpful. So we could sort of tra trace the user to the marketplace page. Uh, and then this might be blue sky, but what we'd really love is some way to track that campaign all the way through to an install. And then while in the extension, when the customer registers, we could track that registration all the way back to the campaign. You know, it's the type of thing that existed forever on the web and is really important in terms of commercialization of services. Um, so I'm hopeful that eventually this will come to the marketplace. I would also add that, you know, um, ideally having like custom metrics that we can add through some API would be great. So the dashboard would display, for example, I want to uh, see the counts for my data preview extension and, and see how many devs use it for looking at CSV data or Excel files things like that, if I can, through some API, register and push that data out to uh, this dashboard, you're working as marketplace. I understand this is probably version two or three, but uh, so ideally that that would be like very similar to what GA does. Yeah, some more I, telemetry based. I, I just wanted, so on the sort of telemetry, I, I, I like the, so right now we have telemetry in, in our extension. We, we use, what is it, Azure App Insights or something like that. And it's working really well. So we get like all the data, you know, someone clicked this, you know, four people clicked this command in the last two hours, three people clicked this. So we have a very detailed view into how our uh, uh, extension is used, but it's, we built it ourselves, right? So I, I could imagine a world where there is a VS Code API uh, and uh, I can just send these telemetry events via the VS Code API and not through an entirely separate system. And I think where this would be especially useful is that we had to figure out all the um, opt-in for telemetry and, and all of that kind of stuff. We had to figure that out ourselves. And if every extension does that and every extension handles it slightly differently uh, and then half of them get the legal landscape wrong because it's actually really complicated to get these uh, 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 telemetry uh, things right. So that might actually be another area where um, if this could go through the marketplace dashboard or something like that, and, and there was a central configuration where users can configure what they opt into and whatnot. That, that I mean, we have that feature right now and it's working, but I could easily see that that would be a very useful um, uh, set of, of APIs in the base product. It's definitely a duplicated effort, effort on many extension developers' part. I see a lot of good extensions, you know, do that. Uh, Azure tracking uh, the events API is really good, uh, and other CSGA. But yeah, uh, consolidating that and kind of just giving us the tools to do it, and we go to one place, go to store, and, and check out our metrics. That would that would be awesome. Yeah, it'd be really nice as well. Just to, you know, I mean, if you think of you have. 20, 30 different extensions installed and every one of them is tracking different things. It's like your processing is also being multiplied by so many times. Where you can it's optimize. It's aggregated yeah. together and sent out in batches at one thing. It would be, you know, much better um, it was scenario. Gonna, I was going to say that, um, and, and Caleb also put this in the chat, uh, that the, the VS Code extension telemetry uh, project that you can pull into your extension uh, is supposed to handle opt-in and opt-out automatically um, so that when someone opts out via a VS Code setting, uh, the, the one that opts out of, of telemetry for the whole product, that it, it, it also includes your extension. Um, and that's something that the VS Code team ships um, and is something should, you might want to look into if you I haven't should. seen it before. I, so I'm not a, a lawyer, but my understanding of these privacy things are is that it is very complicated, and it seems to. So our understanding was that if we collect telemetry uh, and we store it and we have access, then we need to have an opt-in from users specifically for our telemetry because we process it. So, so I, I um, uh, the I, I 
I think right now, if we just piggy pack, sort of just use the setting that is the VS Code setting, and then if someone agreed to the VS Code telemetry collection, and then we started to process their data and, and look at it, I think that would not be okay by at least European law, if I understand this correctly. Yeah, I've I've seen most extensions do that via VS Code API check if telemetry is enabled and then do log into GA. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do that as well in the Azure extensions. And I, I think this is a really good point because we are the same entity, right? We're we're Microsoft. So by opting into Microsoft's um, agreement, their privacy agreement, then you opt into the Azure one as well because it's all one entity. You know, I hadn't really considered the fact that you are a separate entity. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, yeah it seems like... Go Sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, you're good. Well, I was going to say, um, it seems like one, this like extension being able or this this extension that the that vs code team releases should have some mechanism for opting out purely in a single extension that depends on this uh, uh npm package yeah so like the vs code good. thing is good to honor as opt out but it's not good to honor as opt in <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Matt, yeah. really quick while we're still on the subject, when you have discussion with the marketplace team, can you suggest them to extend that feature ribbon to include like three or four rows like you guys, do, like they do for trading in most popular? So it's not only six, they rotate only once or twice a month. Uh, so there's more uh, to pick from on the featured list. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm sorry, can you say that again? I didn't understand. The, the feature ribbon in store, it only shows six extensions that they change like once or uh, every month or every two months. Um, I, I, you know, I've been wanting to kind of see more feature if it's monthly, similar to how we have in trending, we have uh, six styles, but we can uh, flip through it. Like, so it's like what, 18 or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. just a no. thing. So, uh, fun fact, I'm the person who updates the featured extensions. <laughs> <laughs> you are. And I, I typically update it uh, like the week after we ship, the week of, of shipping or the week after that we ship. Okay. Uh, so this is really good feedback. Would you, you, would you rather see, so we have very little control right now, at least over the number of extensions that are rendered there, but I could very easily just make uh, more regular releases to that so that it's updated more often. Uh, yeah, I've noticed that it sort of coincides with the code updates. Yeah, I mean, make it a weekly thing if if you do the picks, right? Okay. I can, I can do that. I, I sometimes have trouble finding things to feature. <laughs> Just because, like, it, it's... Uh, it takes really? some time to go through. Yeah, well, it, it takes some time to go through because I, I want to make sure anything that's featured, yeah. I need to I need to use it. I need to go through and, and make sure everything works as expected. And like with remote, I want to make sure that the extensions work with remote, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I found the trending Easy. monthly. I found trending monthly very helpful. So I usually kind of see what's trending and then you know, don't slow, uh, download, check it out. Yeah, the usuals are kind of promoted to that list, but that top list is definitely, uh, you know, I'm just saying give other devs more chance to to have their extensions featured there. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Tess, I wanted to just circle back to on the one with the, the, the UI toolkit and the, the um, custom editors. Uh, just, just let you know what what is shipping in this release for custom editors is just for custom editors backed by actual text documents from VS Code. So you can sort of like you know provide your own editor on a you know text document. So like I'm building a feature in GitLens that adds a custom editor for a rebase to do file, so that you can actually like have a visual editor for the rebase file. Um, you know, so that's what you can. They ship the binary side uh, and to do, you know, full on custom editors with binary files or files that are backed by not a text document um, that's got pushed off from this release. And that API is still going through one last iteration, um, I, you know, where it's landing. It looks, 
you know, really good. It's another refinement on that. So we're really hopeful that that will land in the next iteration. Um, but just right now, it, it, it's been split in two. So the custom document for text is landing this release. And then the binary, in theory, should land next release. That sounds good. Also, I, I've been working with the with a marketing team internally that is uh, looking to build like some React components, some reusable React components and styling for uh, for our internal extensions. And the the goal there just being that we provide a more consistent experience. Like we have several Microsoft extensions with web view components that have very different controls and they just look kind of all over the place. So the idea was to provide something that looks more more official. Uh, would would you be interested in using that stuff as well? Uh, to be honest, if you if you're gonna build something like that, and this goes back to you know, give us an API to create custom UI toolbars for web mm -hmm. use, right? Um, I would prefer there be more open-ended like web components rather than React or Vue or whatever. Even though I understand you know a lot of developers use it, and maybe your extensions are predominantly React, but uh, you know, web component standard is sort of like, you know, easy to, to grasp, has custom web elements markup and things like that. So if you could make it generic or just have an API of like, okay, here uh, at the bottom to a toolbar and register an action or command to run it, uh, you know, start there rather than kind of pick up this niche front end framework React that some devs, me personally, I might not be big fans of. <laughs> Okay, so, so you like the idea as well. Yeah. So you like the idea just not specific to a single framework. Web yeah. components, I think everybody's moving more to, you know, there there are web component standards that you can create UI frameworks that are more kind of uh, uh, framework agnostic. Cool. I think we would use React stuff. We we've been using React for some of the UI, so uh, but I you know. I know we're getting close out of time. Uh, there's a few more of you. Um, any more thoughts on the two wishes? Yeah, I'd like to go. Um, so uh, let's see here. So my first wish is I don't really like feel like I really understand my users. Um, so I have like a lot of like five star reviews. Uh, so everything like looks good in the review front. Um, but I feel like they're like it's almost like too positive where I'm not really getting like good any good negative information because like I look at I have telemetry and I look at my data and the number of like users doesn't seem to increase like as much that like, it shouldn't, seems like it should be increasing steadily if people were like if I was slowly like gaining users and people kept on using it but uh, the number sort of stays the same so I'm guessing people are like uninstalling it for some reason, and I don't really know why they're uninstalling it. I don't have any like really good way to get in like touch with them. Um, besides using the telemetry to like track them, track them down their city, which would be creepy. <laughs> um, but so if there was like, I just found out there is like a uninstall like thing you can run where you can like run like a node script when the un extension gets uninstalled, and I need to like play around with that. But if there's like something. It looks like it's just like a simple like node script. If you could actually like access the VS Code API, and then like I don't know for like every one hundred users like pop up a survey or something, if they uninstall it, that'd be useful. Or just at generally speaking, some way to like get feedback, get more feedback from them, if I can understand them better. Yeah. So do you? So I'm not I'm not sure exactly how to tackle the 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 better feedback from customers. I can tell you that we do have data, like you, like you just said, we, we obviously have data on installs and uninstalls and updates as well. And that's stuff that I would love to get into the the marketplace dashboard. So maybe that might help. But yeah, the, the I I have this problem as well with the Azure extensions is like I don't know how to reach out to people because there's no non creepy way to do that to say like, hey, I saw that you used this and uninstalled it. What's going on? Um, so I would love that same mechanism. So I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. Also, uh, Caleb, David, Peter, Taurus, uh, some of you mentioned things that I may have questions to follow up on. Do you mind if I reach out to you? Of course not. I don't mind. Yep. Okay, perfect. Good. Perfectly fine. And then, uh, Caleb, you have another one? 
Um, yeah, just one more thing for the first one is that uh, when you eventually do have that dashboard, it'd be cool if it showed you showed the average time uh, like a user spent on the extension or the average time before uninstall install uninstallation. So like how long it is between installation and then uninstallation, and then you can see like okay, are people like immediately uninstalling or like or use it for a few days and then uninstall? Like what the time there would be? That'd be a cool stat. Okay, so it's so more than just install, uninstall, but track a specific customer as they install, use, uninstall. Uh, I was there just was, thinking of averages, but yeah. There was okay. an instant thread in Slack recently uh, that, so we, there are hooks for us to do that, but unfortunately, once they run updates, the uninstall kicks in, and then other, in, well, it doesn't update the counts or anything, but the events to hook up to are not kind of reliable for tracking that. But it's a good point. I've seen with some extensions uh, that's tried to not install it, and I do that often as well. So, but at that point, I think it's almost, it has to be tied to like IP or something. It might get tricky to implement that. Yeah, there's some things that are, that are definitely difficult for us to do. All right, we have five minutes left. Okay. Um, I don't want to like use up all the time if other people want to go. No, use it up. <laughs> okay. Um, so the second wish is for better, or I should say, like like easier testing. Um, and I should have like raised like I originally raised the issue on this in the VS Code repo, and then it got like closed. And like once it get closed, you can't discuss it. I was like, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I should have bothered to like create a new one, but I didn't get I didn't get around to it. But uh, you can't like unit test extensions that well because you can't like unit test um, like unless you have like the VS Code mocked a certain way or uh, have like a dependency objection or something. You can't actually like unit test the VS Code uh, API. Um, so that's pretty unfortunate because unit testing is you know like that's absolutely like critical in terms of having like a stable like app. Like it's the you know the pyramid of testing. Like the unit testing is by far the most important way of testing. And currently, there's just uh, integration testing, which is, uh, I mean, it's still nice, but it's like uh, not nearly as, as important. Um, I, I definitely so, I definitely uh, think somebody on this code team should pick up that effort and put a really good documentation and example of how to write and test harness. I think WebView is the most common. Uh, and a lot of developers ask about it in Slack. I've seen some people roll out. Um, kind of a few things, but testing web use in general is still hard to do. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, you guys could provide a good example, I'm not talking about the cat coding example for that part, uh, it would alleviate a lot of questions new developers have when they start writing extensions. Yeah, I've seen other people ask about it as well. Um, and it might not be possible for it to have like unit testing with VS Code. I don't know. Maybe there's some like internal thing like blocking it. But uh, if it's impossible to do that, which would be unfortunate, just like better resources around integration testing, and maybe like um, some it would be nice. For example, uh, also if you could like get like uh, code coverage stats when integration testing. Um, and yeah, because like I'm a like I have a full time job and like integration testing. Like and then rewriting like ar the architecture to be able to ineffectively uh, do unit testing without like um, like via dependency ejection or like mocking everything. That's like unfortunately like really hard, especially for something that's tightly coupled with VS Code. Like if I wanted to do like there's a lot of simple ex extensions where you it would be like somewhat easy to mock, but the more like complicated you get, the harder it is to uh, just like have to rearchitecture it. Um, so yeah, so better testing would be testing Sorry, resources can I, would be awesome. Can I ask a question for that? Um, like, so relatively easy could be that we expose some of the objects that an extension can create, right? So if you want to test a range, right? That's you know that's an object that the extension owns. You say new range or new position or new completion item, right? Uh, so if your unit tests want want to use those, that's relatively easy. All the objects that VS Code creates and only, you know, like provides to you for consumption, that's very hard because we cannot create 
really needs VS Code for them to be there, right? Um, like an editor or a document, right? So depending on your unit tests, like we could kind of have a node module, which is a mirror of these types, but the rest is really, this is why they're integration tests. And yeah, when I write extensions, I have the same struggle, right? But there's no, it's like, what do you do? How do you write a browser test, right? You have a fake browser, so. Um, so like question is, do you need the simple types like range and position and URI and, and those objects, or do you really want to test, oh, I do line math and the document, right? Uh, I don't know, maybe I could get by with specific objects, but like at this point, like uh, I just do like so many different things with the VS Code API that mm -hmm. like ideally I would just really just need to be able to like import like anything because there's just like so many different objects like the like I'm using both the uh, the web view panel mm -hmm. and I'm also using uh, like I'm trying to get like uh, stuff to show in line too so I'm just show I'm like working with uh, like the text decorations um, mm -hmm. and then I'm also you know working with like I uh, like to have some calls to, like VS Code workspace and the settings API and also like the text document and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's that's very hard, unfortunate, um, because the VS Code does not exist as the module. It's like dynamically generated the time you requested. Um, yeah. yeah, interesting. That's really good, though. But I, I mean, it, at the very least, it sounds like something that we could we could document and mm -hmm. just kind of give some best practices on how we are doing that. Because I know this is something that. That again, like I keep relating a lot of my experiences back to the Azure extensions, but we uh, we do unit testing, we do integration testing, it's all automated, and we have the same sort of struggles, uh, which is why we end up having like some nightly builds. But to your point, we also have devs that are just completely focused on this. It's not it's not like their side project or anything. So the, any way that we can share that experience and, and help get other people up and running quickly, uh, maybe that'll help. Yeah, it'd be good to like share it, like, cause also especially like it's good to like, if uh, like unit testing with VS Code, like if that will never be possible, then it's like critical to have people writing their uh, extensions in a way that can be like where VS Code can be like mocked to start with, because if they like start writing their extension in a way where it's like not uh, where they would have to re-architecture it, then that's like gets really hard to. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Okay, uh, we are at time. Eric, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, I just, just want to give Yuki a chance. I think he was the last one. I know we're over, but... Um, if I could say something. Mm -hmm. uh, you... Me? Yeah, if you, if you guys want to just quickly, uh, and I know we're a little bit over time, but I just want to... Ah, okay. Turn this off if we can. My, my, mine is quick. It's... Okay, you, you, you go. Okay. Mm. So I have two requests about document. Uh, the current API reference has a few examples. I want the example of source code, like the Python document. So second request is about uh, API duplication. So Microsoft team actually sent us the mail and issue to updating the OI extensions functions, but uh, it should be coding rule like ESLint. So currently I made the sample coding rule and language servers sample. So I'll put them on, on the chat after. Thank you. It's my quick response. Okay, I didn't totally understand the first one. Can you help me understand the first one a little bit? Uh, you, mm, sorry, you mean, I, you asked my first question again, right? Yeah. Uh, so my first request is uh, uh, improving the API usage. So you have a VS Code API usage on the VS Code document, right? And you have a tutorial. 
However, I is, want to... Is there a specific place that you'd like that updated? Like, what what are you looking at that you that you see is it needs to be updated or improved? Uh, sorry, I'll put the link. Are you mainly talking about basically you know, document, you know, linking documentation to the source code examples using those APIs? Yes, I want okay. the example to sharing the knowledge. So sometimes my, I may, maybe my extensions implementation was wrong, but I can't know is it correct or not now. OK, yeah, and then your second one? Uh, you said some of the API duplication? Yes, so like the, can I show the, my, uh, my screen? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, security. Ah, uh, okay. I'll talk by my mouse. Uh, for example, some uh, source code like the workspace root path. It was uh, deprecated, right? Root path. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you know, right? So it you said it should be uh, here, but actually you said that in email, but in actually this source code is correct than the email contents. Okay, I got you, I got you. Yes, yes. So I made the coding rules on the my linters for VS Code, like. Uh, Got it. Yeah, so basically you have a yeah, add in lint rules that see the deprecation and offer suggestions yeah. on what to use instead. Yes, so I personally made that rules, but uh, no VS Code API developer will visit my page. So it should be on the VS Code page. Mm, it's my second request. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I heard all the Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to uh, upvote some of the other issues that people say, like the clickable gutters that people ask. Um, or information in the marketplace statistics, like um, which OS is being used for uh, the user is using, read the number, and get code and expansion numbers, and the insider, insider release would be mm. a great, uh, great addition. But uh, one one issue that I I have, in, in fact, I'm waiting is the home screen, the welcome screen customization. Uh, I see at least my project manager extension would uh, inject some projects in the site. And I think other extensions like uh, Java and maybe uh, Lua, maybe R could be used, uh, could use the customization to prepare and order information. So, in fact, this, I had added these clickable gutters and this welcome screen customization would be the most, at least for me, would be the the two issues that I would like to to have to add in VS Code. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm just writing notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just want to thank everyone for their time and um, you know meeting with us here. And like I mentioned, we're going to try to 
do this, um, you know, probably in a similar fashion with the sign up links to get rotating um, extension authors um, and, you know, try to do this once per iteration. Um, and, you know, we'll probably have different themes, uh, you know, coming up and hopefully on the next one, we'll actually have, uh, you know, this being live streamed as well for a wider audience. Um, and, you know, like Matt mentioned at the beginning, we will post this up, uh, you know, either on a YouTube channel or, or somewhere uh, so that this can be reviewed by the community, uh, viewed by the community. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, just, you know, just want to thank you all for, you know, your your work uh, on, on the extensions and, you know, definitely want to hear any other feedback. I mean, we do have, um, you know, there's GitHub for the issues and stuff, but there's, you know, there's also um, a, a Slack channel for extension authors. I, I encourage you to, uh, you know, join that. Um, I'm in there all the time uh, and we're, we definitely love to get the feedback on how we can make things better. So thanks everyone. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.